Oh man, like with so many things in life, when you're doing geology on a reservoir, timing is everything. Today I'm at Glendo Reservoir here in Eastern Wyoming, and I'm sitting on the Sundance Formation. Now when I was here last year, the water level was a lot higher. It was about 20 feet higher or more. I couldn't get to these rocks. They were underwater. Great habitat for walleye, which I was fishing for. Not so great for looking at the rocks. Today, the water has been going down. It's at about 47% capacity right now. It's about 20 something feet low. Bad news if you're wanting to have some nice flooded trees to hide in. Great news for a geo nerd like me. It's exposed some unique features that you normally can't see because of high water. You found something. I'm glad you asked. Looking across this hill, it looks like just a random scattering a flat slabby rock and it is it's coming from the redwater shale member of the sundance formation which you can see in place up there you can actually see some of the original bedding it's a brittle shale so it's breaking up into these plates almost like a slate but it's not a slate it's not metamorphosed it's a shale and very fine grained sand but take a look at these on the surfaces of these fragments of the shale are weird geometric features like this, kind of rust colored, striated, yellowish brown. Are they trace fossils? What are these things? Are they plant roots? Are they invertebrate trace fossils? Fossil wicker from dinosaur basket weavers? I don't know. Let's take a look around and see if we can figure out what exactly these really weird things are. Some have an almost geometrical polygonal design. Others are more organic looking. Others look sort of webby. There's a whole variety of textures and shapes and architectures to these things. Ooh, here's an interesting slab. So if we're gonna test our first hypothesis that these might be invertebrate trace fossils, let's compare them to some actual invertebrate trace fossils. Here's a slab that's got invert traces as well as our yellowish brown weird features. The invertebrate trace fossils are things like Paleophycus, um, and it looks like they're basically horizontal tubes. They might even be some Planolites if they're not lined. So they're horizontal tubes that got filled in with sediment and they're kind of curving, they're the same diameter. They represent worms burrowing through the sediment. That's not what these weird features look like. In fact, they're way too straight and geometric to have been made by most organisms. Most marine traces don't look like that. In fact, most marine animals don't make really straight, striated features like that. Hmm. The other aspect that suggests they're not marine traces is how they taper. So marine traces, or any trace made by an animal, has to be the same diameter all the way across for that thing to work its way through. If it's a little shrimp or a little worm or a mole or a gopher, the trace, the burrow, has to be the same diameter all the way through for that little guy to get through. These things get thinner, branch, taper. Not what you expect in an animal burrow. Not, not something a worm or shrimp would make. Take a look at those. It's the same story. They kind of branch. They taper. So the second question is, could they be roots? So if these things are roots, that would suggest we're in a continental environment, terrestrial, because trees, plants, shrubs that would have made roots like this obviously live in a terrestrial system. That's kind of countered by the fact that we have traces like this, things called thalassinoides, which are made by shrimp, marine shrimp in particular, and thalassinoides is found all throughout here. There's also beautiful rhizocorallium like this, and rhizocorallium is a trace made by a marine polychaete. So they like that marine bottom water that's kind of quiet so as not to interfere with their life. Hey, who doesn't like that? We also have marine fossils like that little bivalve. Again, it's a marine clam, not very common in the forest floor. That's strike two. Strike three, if you don't like my clam or my thalassinoides, here are some little bitty trace fossils called chondrites. Chondrites is a uniquely branching trace. A lot of people misinterpret them as roots. That's pretty important here because chondrites is made by polychaete worms that live 
in oxygen poor or stressed marine environments. They look like little tiny branching roots, but they're the same diameter all the way across. So we've got chondrites suggesting oxygen poor, deeper marine environments. We've got clams. We've also got thalassinoides, the shrimp bar traces. But wait, there's one more really cool thing I want to show you. That's right, there's ammonites. You can see the shell here with the distinct whorl and the ridges on it. It's covered in algae because the lake level's gone down, but you can still see that really nice, distinct ammonite shape to it. A marine fossil from the Jurassic. So we've got marine body fossils, we've got marine trace fossils, we've got nothing to suggest that this is a terrestrial environment. Why do we have roots out here? Let's take a closer look at those things. Maybe they're not roots after all. See, things like this, where you have intersecting, that is not at all common in roots. Roots typically don't grow into each other. They branch out, they create frondescent patterns, but they don't intersect. Something does intersect that fills in with sediment like that, though. And if we keep looking around, we might find some more evidence of what that is. Okay, bingo. I got it. Right here on the nose of this outcrop, take a look behind me at the way the brittle shale and sand have fractured. Intersecting fractures, creating not quite polygonal, kind of a random distribution, but a network that almost looks like a web work, a wicker basket-like shape. This image, scale's a little bit different, but this image of these interconnected fractures is very similar to what we're seeing at a smaller scale filled in with that sediment, with that kind of rustish yellow colored brownish material. This basket network, that kind of basket woven network of fractures gives us a really important clue to the mechanism that created our mystery features back here. And if you want even better examples of fracture networks getting filled in with that ironstone mineral, here are some beautiful examples below me. You can see this is the sediment that's fractured in a very regular pattern filled in with the ironstone. And in fact, if we come around the front, there's what the network looks like, that fracture network. Look at that. Okay, here's what I was looking for. In cross-sectional view, that upper surface of the redwater shale displays beautiful fractures filled in with the same material, that same ironstone material that we see at the smaller scale on the bedding plane features. In this case, it's going down, geez, almost about a meter. This is a succession of fractures that happened probably well after the material we're looking at, but it gives us an important clue because here is spelling out exactly what's going on. So these bigger fractures tell us that the weird little features we're seeing, these guys, are not trace fossils at all. They're not roots, they're not burrows, they're something entirely different. They're actually fractures. Look at the other side of this rock I didn't show you. See, context is everything. The fractures at the top of this rock facilitated percolation of ironstone. In this case, I suspect it's limonite. Hey, if you're a geochemist, if you know about this kind of thing, comment below because I'm making this part up. I suspect it's limonite because the color, got that yellowish color, almost looks fibrous. Um, that's what I would call it, but I'm not a geochemist. If you know better, message me below in the comments. My guess is it's limonite, but it's definitely an iron precipitate. And you can tell that because it's got that kind of rusty color to it, top and bottom mimicking trace fossils. And in fact, we see different variations of it throughout the Sundance. Here's another example of those fractures that are filled in with limonite. So it'd be really easy if somebody came to you and said, hey, Dr. Anton, or hey, whoever you are watching this, what is this? Is this a trace fossil? Is it a plant? Is it a root system? Is it a burrow system? You might at first go, well, yeah, it sure looks like it. Somebody showed you a photograph, and I actually did this on social media. I put examples of this on LinkedIn just to see what people thought. A fair number of people thought it might be burrows or roots through no fault of their own. They didn't have the context. Context is everything, because take a look at this. When you take it, flip it around, there's your context. Fractures. You don't believe that? Here's an even wider context. So how do these fractures form? 
Well, in subsurface, this is a sand. This sand is brittle, it breaks, it allows groundwater to percolate through, and that groundwater takes with it iron oxide that is dissolved from the surrounding rocks. All the rocks out here are chock full of iron oxide, the Jurassic, the Triassic, all kinds of red beds. That iron oxide moves through the groundwater, gets deposited in these fractures, and creates these really, really cool geometric patterns that mimic trace fossils, but they're not trace fossils. So now you know the story with these. Now you won't be so easily fooled if somebody brings you something and says, is this a plant? Is this a fossil? You can say, hmm, let's see if it actually is a fracture fill. Context is king. I hope you found this kind of interesting. Thanks for watching as always. And until next time, I'll see you on the outcrop. Now I got to get back to fishing.